very much for joining us here again for another excited session, plenary number two, titled Responsible and Sustainable Space Exploration, Moon to Mars, which is organized by the AIDA, the host of the 75th International Astronautical Congress here in Milan. This plenary wants to emphasize the critical need for fostering responsible and sustainable space exploration particular as humanity embarks on moon to mars missions including the artemis program of course it is my great pleasure to welcome on stage the moderator of this session the director of the united nations office for outer space affairs dr ati ola maini please come on stage give her a warm a war of welcome Before I hand over to Arti, let me just mention to you that also for this session you will have the chance to ask questions which come up during, uh, during this panel. Please use the Slido system again and we'll do our best also to reserve some time at the end to ask some questions from the audience. Arti, the floor is yours. Good evening everyone. It's almost the end of a very long but enjoyable day. Um, excellencies and distinguished guests, it's my great honor to be moderating this session and my thanks to Azi for inviting me to do so. Um, I, I'm going to just start by inviting my panelists to join me on stage. We have Erasmo Carrera, president of AIDA, who I'm sure you will agree has done a tremendous job in co-hosting this year's IAC so far. Teodoro Valente, president of ASI. Pam Melroy, Deputy Administrator of NASA. Roberto Cingolani, CEO of Linardo. And Didier Schmidt, Exploration Strategy and Coordination Lead at the European Space Agency. Thank you for joining me. So, ladies and gentlemen, there is a lot of discussion right now on space sustainability, but it is usually in the context of an increasingly congested LEO orbit. I'm wondering, can we really limit our discussions on sustainability to only Leo, Mio, and even Geo, when we can see that on the one hand, we have a renewed enthusiasm on the part of space agencies for returning to the moon and going beyond, and secondly, the commercial sector is playing an ever more important role in lunar activities as well. Furthermore, many space actors have an eye towards using the moon as a springboard for the further exploration of Mars and beyond. So for me, this means that we have to start the conversation now on establishing responsible practices to ensure um, space sustainably, sustainability more broadly uh, beyond the Earth's orbit. Um, COPUS, which is the Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, uh, convenes states around these kind of issues. It is UNUSA's job to support the committee in doing this. And in thinking about this topic, I firmly believe that we can learn important lessons, not just from what has happened in the past, but uh, what we see happening right before us now. I would invite you to consider a very recent example, the scenario of the two astronauts who are staying a little bit longer um, on the ISS than they anticipated. Besides reminding us that space exploration is still extremely complex, dangerous, risky, and obviously expensive, um, this scenario provides a great example against which to measure how we might approach future space exploration activities. The safe return of these two astronauts depends entirely on one country right now, and more specifically, even on industry. Um, within the next five years, we could so easily see this kind of a scenario on the moon. I mean, I think that was a really big takeaway from me when I uh, was watching what was going on. It highlighted to me the importance on, of the Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space uh, to convene countries around these kind of issues and international collaboration, but also that this could so easily happen on other bodies, most importantly right now, the moon. So are we really willing to put the lives of future world citizens in the hands of individual countries? Or um, given that we are pushing rocket science to the max these days, 
Should we not rather be trying to minimize risk through maximum cooperation on, for example, interoperability and standards and so on? So against that background, I would like to start a conversation. And Pam, if you don't mind, I would like to start with you. With your commercial crew program, NASA has made sure that there were at least two companies who could safely transport both cargo and humans into space. And it's thanks to that approach that the two astronauts I was referring to um, can be safely returned home. Now, not all spacing and spacefaring nations have the capacity to have these kind of backup plans like, like NASA has facilitated in the US. But can international coordination, for example, on interoperability, help ensure redundancy for future missions and with doing so help us reduce risk? Uh, absolutely. Thank you for raising that. We do think that it's incredibly important to have uh, dissimilar redundancy, to have at least two vehicles that are capable of performing the mission. I think we should all have a vision for spaceflight to be like any other form of transportation. You all came here on different airplanes, different trains, different cars, different modes of, of transportation. And uh, imagine a world where there was only one type of airplane. Uh, we, we had challenges during the space shuttle program when we had issues with the vehicle uh, that required some rework and uh, to, to safely go forward. So we feel very strongly that that dissimilar redundancy is important. Uh, and we would like to extend it out to the future. But I think for today, just like other forms of transportation, the reason why that dissimilar redundancy works is because that we have interoperability and common standards in our airports, in our train stations, in our ships' ports. And so the ability for us to work together on interoperability and standards will actually help promote the ability, I mean, that's a terrible thought, what somebody having an astronaut stranded somewhere in space and through the lack of a common docking mechanism not be able to bring them back or help them in some way. That is, that just, we can't let that happen. I think that, that, would, uh, that would be a big mistake. So I think there is a lot to learn from the past here and other modes of transportation as well. Fantastic, thank you so much. And I think we would be doing a disservice to future astronauts and so on if we didn't ensure that we work on this. So Theodora, if I can come to you, um, in 1.5 years time or so, you're going to have the joyful task of chairing um, COPUS uh, and um, ATLAC, which is the action team for, lun for sustainable lunar activities, which was established by the Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space just this year in June. Um, ATLAC will be in the, the middle of its deliberations when you assume the chair. Um, and within COPUS, it's arguably the only venue right now uh, where we can hope for a real discussion on, this kind of, on these kind of topics, interoperability and global, global uh, cooperation. Um, how can Italy leverage its experience in strategic collaborations, and you have a lot of it, um, with other space players to ensure that ATLAC is going to be effective in establishing sustainable lunar practices? Thank you, Ati. Thank you for this question. I mean, this was a discussion we had just 20 minutes ago, Pam, yeah. during the table of Artemis Accords. So we are thinking on the best way in order to involve as much as possible actors in this topic, which is important not for the Italian Space Agency, not for NASA, but is important for all the countries uh, which are involved in sustainable exploration. So we do have shared some uh, ideas, uh, and let me say some standards, some guidelines uh, inside the work which has been done on the table of the Artemis Accords, and we all think that this basic principle uh, should be, must be discussed inside COPOS because we need to involve as much as possible uh, countries in the world. Otherwise, uh, these general uh, issues uh, which are not related to a single country will never see, uh, see the end. Thank you, Teodoro. Uh, not an easy task uh, to lead 
but I'm sure we will benefit from your insights. Um, Roberto, let me come to you. Uh, industry has got a really important role to play. And during IAC, UNUSA will be convening lunar companies um, to hear from them where they believe that industry can contribute um, to sustainable space exploration. Um, on the one hand, industry is a lot more agile um, than, than governments can be, and they're less constrained by the geopolitics that surround all of this. But at the same time, we know that companies, um, they like to have competitive edges over each other. They, they often follow proprietary routes and so on. So how, we, we know that open standards and interoperability are going to be absolutely key drivers of sustainability. Do you believe that industry can be convinced to take a more collaborative approach to work on common standards to avoid the scenario that we see with the two astronauts who need a very specific um, spacesuit to be able to come back down to Earth because of a lack of interoperability? Yeah, thank you for the question, Arta. Um, let me start with, with a simple example. Right now, on the, what happens on the Earth, uh, we're trying to develop cross-domain interoperability in defense. That means you have a satellite that is controlling what happens in land in, in a digital continuum, which is a volume of space where different platforms, aircraft, helicopters, ships, uh, land defense systems, vehicles, they have to be interconnected. And that maybe a real-time decision-making um, technology based on AI will be the glue of all this uh, uh, in interoperability, cross-domain interoperability. We're struggling to do this. We're struggling because each country would like to have its own uh, sovereignty. Europe has 27 member states, and everyone, each one would like to have its own interoperability. So, you know, th th this is a big challenge, and it's the easiest one. Now let's go to space. The conditions are extreme, but far more than on the land surface. Um, and I think that in the near future, um, we will have to bring uh, in, the, in the outer space or on some satellite uh, big uh, space stations that have to be interoperable because different vectors should connect and, and transfer people. And then you need to bring energy in the, in the, on the surface of the outer planets. Could it be a small modular reactors, nuclear reactors? Or could it be in the future a small fusion reactor? At the moment, we don't go far with, for sure with the, with the photovoltaics, uh, if you want to do serious stuff. You want to bring internet. You want to create a digital continuum. You need power for high-performance computing. And then you want to have GPS on a satellite that you don't know, or on a planet that you don't know. So those things are energy consuming. We need a standard for, for energy. We need a standard for machines. And ultimately, we, we will need robots, intelligent autonomous systems that are morphic, capable to adapt, changing their shape depending on the needs, because humans will not be able to work for hours and hours and hours in the outer, in the outer surface of a planet without atmosphere. So this is paramountly more difficult than the cross-domain interoperability we want to do on land for defense. Companies can only get together and be allied, and private and public can only be uh, allied. Otherwise, there is no chance to, do, to, to be successful in this, in this respect. And consider that we're not going to make big money with this kind of technology for the beginning. The money in the, in the space economy comes from, from primarily from services. Before you get money out of services in the, in the space, in, out, in outside space, we will need a lot of time. So for the beginning, we have to invest. We have to cooperate. We have to share knowledge with the public and among the privates. I'm confident this is easier in the space than, than on Earth, unfortunately. I'm going to stay with you for one second. Usually when we talk about standards, it's because there are economies of scale to be tapped, right? We, we know that by creating mass markets, we can earn more. We can unlock a huge market. When it comes to space missions, yes, there's a lot of missions, but is it, is it enough to constitute a mass Very market? Very small numbers. I mean, how many planets you want to invade in the next 20 years? Maybe two, if we're lucky, Moon and Mars. So I know this is a, a, a huge challenge, but you will never make a mass production for the beginning. In the future, when we, you will have colonies and maybe what else, so there will, there will be services, and then we will make a lot of money. But you have to go up to the point that you create a community, a, a large market. Mm -hmm. At the moment, this is the top of the knowledge of humanity. Mm -hmm. This needs a joint effort. You don't do this for money, at the beginning at least. Right. Thank you very much. OK, I'm going to go to Erasmo. Uh, Erasmo, we've heard from space agencies. We've heard from industry. What role can the triple helix of academia, government, and industry um, play in fostering innovation to enhance sustainability? Yeah, thank you, Arti, for the question. But I first want to say that I'm really 
very glad to see this room full. <laughs> this uh, very early day, so it's really, I was not expecting this auditorium full of people, so that's really, uh, really Especially very, in the evening. <laughs> especially in the evening, you know, probably the welcome reception is going to, to start in a few minutes, so. But um, yeah, and, and, and you know, when, when from people from academia, usually this is the question we always make, uh, you know, because we produce, especially for an engineering school as uh, uh, in the place I am, so we always make this kind of question. And uh, the point is uh, that to, when you do this in a very good way, you can have a chance to solve the problems. And uh, if you look uh, at the history of, of our country, when we have done this in the very uh, best way, we have done the best uh, is, uh, results in space. And, uh, uh, but if you see also IAC Milan was uh, a triple X event because we put academia, <laughs> the institutional Italian space agency at the industry and then you see the result. So this is very important, the point is uh, uh, that you have to find a way to implement it. And of course, sustainability is really a good point. And innovation is a good point to put these three uh, partners together, working together. And uh, uh, we are trying to do this. Uh, of course, uh, what are, uh, what are the, the difficulties in doing the, uh, that? You know, innovation is uh, in some area is something the big companies have to do. No chance, they have to spend money because in some fields you have to put a lot of money in the innovation. In some others, you have not the money to put on if, if you need. Space is one of these because space, you know, to get the money back is very difficult. Then innovation is made, people say we use open innovation. So we try to, 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 to get ideas from uh, small companies, and, uh, uh, and the small companies uh, provide the, the ideas uh, and uh, they do a lot of work, very hard work, especially they are m made by young, post young, young people, postdocs and so on. They spend the night to, do the, uh, to work on, on it and, uh, and, and then you, 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 can you can use it. And uh, uh, of course, um, this is something that if you look how it is made, for instance, in Italy, I talk about my country, and also in, if you compare how open innovation is considered by the institution in other places, there is a big difference. And uh, uh, of course, uh, the institution should have a um, special feeling with uh, this kind of open innovation, so to try to find programs to sponsor this kind of things. And the, as, as I said, of course, sustainability is really a uh, good topic to, 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 to work uh, all together. And, uh, but we also, also we discuss during your, uh, your workshop party is one of the main point is to try a way to fix rules, right? Because if you don't fix rules, then it will be difficult to really make something sustainable, right? Because we have to, to, to try to really find a way that, uh, uh, for instance, very simple thing about uh, that everyone can understand is debris. Now we create always debris, right? And we do not have really rules that uh, we have to remove the debris we create, uh, right? So we, we need some rules, and this is something that can be done at the political level probably, and this is easier when you work, uh, for instance, says in Italy we have a situation which uh, uh, the triple X are mostly you say governed by the yeah the Italian government because uh, the university is uh, from the government as is the government and Leonardo is somehow from the government as well so this should be easier to do it but we need someone that is is so brave to try to fix rule <laughs> and then we say okay they are wrong we can improve that, but we need someone that is going to fix rules and to respect these rules. At the moment, it's difficult to do it. Yes, and you raise an interesting point there. I, I, if I can jump back to you, Roberto, for a second, um, not scripted this time, but still, uh, can we count on industry to uh, take their own initiative to come together? 
or do they need to be convened? I mean, when it comes to Luna, we will convene them as an office, as a part of our capacity building role, but industry of their own accord is not necessarily going to start working on common standards, are they? We, we have to be very clear about this, this issue. Um, uh, Erasmus said uh, we are public. We're actually, not true. My, <laughs> gently not true. My main shareholder, 30%, is the Ministry, ministry of fin Finance. But I report to the market, and I'm a listed at the stock market, and I report to the market. Whatever I do has to be accepted by the market. And all my peers in different countries, they undergo this, the, the same rules. Of course, because we treat defense, the, the state must be in the board, because you, know, you have to control that uh, you respect uh, defense sovereignty and so on and so forth. But we are actually uh, very complex multinational companies. So, um, to answer your question, we're not so um, free to do what we want because, as you know, there are geopolitical balances to respect. In Europe, we, we're working hard to create champions, to create big um, groups that are collaborating, but still we have to talk to our states because ultimately the states have the last word on national sovereignty. And this is unfortunately something we have to take into account. I think even the states, um, there are rules that Elon Musk, in collaborating with, with an ASA and other bodies, they have to respect, I think, because national safety is national safety. It's public, ultimately. That's great. You actually reinforce the importance of uh, the action team which has been created by COPUS in saying that then, uh, and the importance of the collaboration between the member states. Thank you. Okay, Didier, let me come to you. Um, ESA, on the one hand, you're synonymous with international collaboration because you convene all of your, your member states. Uh, you are also championing the Zero Debris Charter, which includes lunar orbits. It's important to note that. Um, at the same time, one of your prime objectives is to ensure the competitiveness of European, um, European companies and the European uh, uh, capacities on the global um, stage. And right now, that is arguably got to be one of the top priorities. So how can ESA ensure European competitiveness and also reconcile it with sustainable practices, which often can come at a cost? Yeah, ab absolutely. I mean, first of all, um, we have issued a few months ago um, the uh, European uh, strategy for exploration. It's called Expo 2040. In there, the vision is very straightforward. We say we have to do exploration in a sustained, sustainable, and responsible way. So, nice words, yeah, I, uh, I admit. Now they have to be transformed into, into action and, and into programs. Um, so we are really committed to do this. Now, responsible means it's more expensive, but so be it. That's the price to pay, uh, so uh, absolutely. And Maybe I'm old school, but I still believe that exploration, it has to be institutional driven, even though there are commercial activities and, 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 and commercial actors that, that can have uh, play, play their role. But that also means that the institutional level, the government level, has to put the guidelines and has to put some uh, uh, obligations cannot be reinforced multinationally, but at least on the ESA side and maybe others, um, other agencies should have this as a, a, a rule, as a, as a baseline, so to say. Now, of course, there is competition, and therefore uh, you would go for the lowest uh, price, and, uh, but if this means that you don't respect these high-level, uh, so to say, vision statements, that's not the way to go. Uh, obviously, you cannot deorbit and burn things in in moon orbit, um, and uh, when you land anything on on the moon surface, it will stay there. So this is where we have to make sure, also with the future very heavy heavy landing, 20 tons plus landings and and takeoff again, uh, the blast effects that you have. So it's not just landing something and nothing happens, and you take off and nothing happens. So there are issues to be, to be looked at. So really, we shall also have a say in there, even if it's a commercial activity. By the way, if there are commercial activities today which are popping up, it is because they are based or they base their activities on the shoulders of others. And most of the time, it has been and it is public money 
since decades, since generations. Uh, you cannot just invent a rocket like this, or a satellite, or a lander. This has been mostly institutional driven since, since the, uh, the beginning. And therefore, it's a given that this investment and know-how created by public money has also, has a, and therefore has a say, the public opinion even, and, and, and the agencies have a say into how uh, even commercial activities for exploration are, are uh, put forward. Great, thank you. And I want to stay with you for a second, perhaps just for clarification for, for me and for the audience. Uh, when companies have signed on to ESA Zero Debris Charter, that is as far as ESA missions or ESA funded missions go. Does that also impact, uh, for example, if a commercial company orders a satellite from Airbus? Does it extend further? Is it a commitment from, these, from other actors to extend the Zero Debris Charter into their broader activities? Well, the principle here is that we want to lead by example. That's, that's the baseline. Um, so we will, of course, uh, push, so to say, these companies to do the same. And obviously, you, need, you see also the uh, popping up of these, uh, uh, all these missions where it's capturing and deorbiting uh, uh, we call today trash or satellites which are obsolete and so on. Um, instead of doing this, well, yeah, we have to do it. But in addition, we should avoid that this is needed for future uh, uh, satellite launches. And we will start, as you have said, we are even committed to look into this around the moon, and we will start a study to see what the impact is and what the impact on the technology is, uh, bringing satellites into graveyard orbits uh, after their use or minimizing uh, uh, the risk for collision or, or uh, even spiraling down on the surface of the, of the moon. Thank you. I think leading by example requires a certain amount of courage and boldness. I very much hope that uh, ESA, but also the European Union with their space law can, will actually have the guts to see that through rather than looking at how what might this affect competitiveness. Okay, second round of questions. I want to turn my attention to the theme of developing countries and their involvement. Teodoro, can I come back to you? I know that ASI cares very deeply about working with other developing nations on an equal footing, demonstrated also by the Mate Plan for Africa. How can we include developing countries in making our journey to the moon and Mars more sustainable? Yes, thank you. Our effort in uh, collaboration and cooperation with uh, African and Latin American countries uh, is really a commitment for the Italian Space Agency. And uh, I think we do have many, many examples which can be, could be told to you in order to confirm this. Um, First of all, if we look to some of the young professional or small and medium enterprises uh, which are present uh, here in the International Astronautic Conference, this presence was supported by our Ministry of University and Research and by, and by the Italian Trade Agency. This is one example. Then, generally speaking, about uh, uh, emerging countries, this, this also was one of the topics that we discussed uh, uh, one hour ago on the Artemis Accords. Uh, I think uh, that there are some models uh, which can be followed in order to be effective. Uh, I can tell about our experience, uh, which is uh, something uh, available to everybody uh, and to every colleagues uh, and every agency. Uh, for example, you know, we do have a, a very uh, long uh, tradition uh, with Kenya through our Malindi base. Uh, that place, uh, the space uh, Braulio uh, base, uh, um, was the starting of the space Italian activity in the 60s uh, with uh, Professor Braulio. Uh, but we didn't stop the collaboration with them, and uh, we are now relaunching the collaboration with the Kenyan colleagues, uh, for example, through the uh, realization of a regional center for Earth observation, uh, as well as, and this is a general approach which can be used uh, with emerging country by developing together with them, together with the Kenyan Space Agency, this means together with agency of other countries, uh, in the case we want to reply, capacity building uh, uh, activities, training courses uh, in order to 
let uh, the expertise grow directly in situ and remain there in order to support the scientific community and the technical community. And this is, uh, generally speaking, also fully in line with the MATE plan, uh, which has been adopted by our government. Uh, we are an, a governmental agency, so we uh, help uh, our government, our institution, to uh, define action in order to reach the goals uh, that they, they, they have uh, defined with their policy. Uh, but not only uh, capacity building activities, uh, uh, also technical payloads, uh, which are another thing very important. Let me again uh, um, make an example about our cooperation with, with, uh, with Kenya, uh, which was also appreciated at the UN national level, I mean, at the international level. Uh, if I uh, remember the successful launch of the ICONS CubeSat, uh, now we are to ICONS 3 Simba and ICONS 2, which will be aboard the Chinese space station. This was selected by UN also, the first example. So uh, it's a sort of, uh, let me say, of common action, uh, which can be, which must be, which should be, uh, up to our opinion, uh, put on the table of the discussion also of the Artemis Accord, as we made this afternoon. And this afternoon uh, we discussed, uh, there were, Pam, I don't remember exactly, but I think 14 interventions about these topics this afternoon, the highest number with respect to the, the other question. So this, this means that the, the argument, uh, uh, I'd say, is, uh, is very important for, for, uh, for everybody. And so we will discuss, we will continue to discuss with them, not for them, together with them. For example, uh, trying to identify uh, if, if we define a concrete roadmap together with them for their development to support the scientific community, to support their participation, to events, workshop, workshop to share their needs uh, and to let them uh, to speak each other uh, and to share uh, their needs and their experience. This is uh, something which we have done not only, uh, um, as you remember, Arti, uh, with the African, but we have done also uh, through the uh, International Space Forum, which is organized by the Italian Space Agency. Uh, the last one has been the Gulf chapter uh, in Manama, Bahrain. The next one, next year, will be uh, in uh, the southeast of Asia. Uh, so many action all together with the same aim. Uh, use the space diplomacy in order to let colleagues express their needs and this is very important for the space faring nations uh, and work with them in order to help them on the basis uh, of an equal cooperation, uh, which is the only way to involve in our activities these countries. I'm just going to springboard to a question that came in online because I think what you're saying is relevant. How do we balance the need for regulatory safety and environmental oversight on the one hand um, with the perceived urgency that we can see that some countries have in, in being the first uh, to, to you know, go back to the moon, to reach Mars, and so on. Yeah, I mean, this, uh, is the, uh, this is one of the underlying uh, aims of the Artemis Accords. I mean, uh, if we uh, enter in the idea that we must be the first and our rules can exist, everybody has its own rules. But we have established uh, many discussion forum at the international level uh, with uh, the USA, with the other partners, with the UN inside the corpus, uh, just to only, not on, let's say, to define and to share common rules uh, which can be used by everybody mm -hmm. in order to avoid this risk. Thank you. Brilliant. Okay, Pam, let me come to you. Um, Artemis Accords has been mentioned quite a bit. I think you had a meeting earlier today. Um, that the, the accords ensure that different countries are on the same page in terms of principles, uh, and th those principles necessarily do include responsibility and sustainability concepts like interoperability, um, space debris mitigation, emergency assistance, and so on. How is NASA ensuring that emerging space nations can benefit from their participation in the accords? 
Yeah, thank you, RT. I appreciate that. I, I'm, I'm going to take a moment and talk about the word sustainability, because I think it's important actually to have this conversation. It is often used uh, in our community, and it's used in two different ways. One to mean a sustained presence, like how are we going to make this work long term? And then it's also referred to and the aspect of uh, the way we apply it here terrestrially, that we have a limited amount of resources and we have to um, sustain uh, the way, the, be sustainable in the activities that we do so that we don't run out of or waste Earth's precious resources. Now, they're actually linked to some extent in space because if you decide you're going to live there for a very long time, by definition, you have to be very sustainable. And we see that on the International Space Station. Uh, we have some challenges. There's no question. Trash is probably the biggest one. And the worst offender in trash is actually the foam that we use to launch things into space against the vibration of the rockets. And then once it's there, what are you going to do with it? So that's a real challenge. But in other areas, we've made enormous progress, like in water reclamation. That's very important. When we go to Mars, we are going to have to have a fully closed loop system with 100% reclamation. We have to. It's not like there's a cargo ship that's going to come chasing after us on the way to Mars to load up with air and water. So there is a connection between the two, but I think it's worth reminding us that sustainable presence, meaning over a long period of time, relies on a lot of other things too like infrastructure, power communications, et cetera, whereas sustainability um, is a, is a, has a different overlapping subset. So I just want to make sure I bring that up because that's a problem that we've had sometimes is being sure what we're talking about. But let's talk about uh, our uh, emerging space nation partners. I think, Teodoro, you said it so incredibly well. From, from my standpoint, when I look at the Artemis Accords, we are acting essentially without any rules other than the Outer Space Treaty of which the Artemis Accords were built. It was an attempt to take one more step in a very concrete way around the moon and our activities around the moon to apply those principles in a way. In essence, we're creating norms of behavior and expectations, including being responsible, sustainable, as it were, and, and not, uh, not making a lot of trash, not destroying. Uh, the moon is complicated. There's no air. There's no animals. There's no plants. But there is great scientific value in the moon. We need to make sure we're preserving the scientific value of the moon and sharing it. And so that's a great example of sustainability as applied to the moon. From our standpoint, what that means is humanity is going together out into the solar system, which means we need to go as humanity. So the most important thing is what one country might think is a sustainable practice or applies to them may not be the same as another country views it. They may have their own experience, their own culture, and their own values. So the importance of the Artemis Accords is actually the conversation that we have to ensure that once everyone is, I mean, it's a challenge. We have to talk about some of these complicated issues to make sure that everybody understands, no, really, there's limited transportation routes around the South Pole of the moon, things like that. Once we're all on the same page, let's then talk about the solutions together. Because if we're going to go to space, we should go to space as humanity. And that means the collective wisdom and the views on how we do things sustainably uh, for the future is critical. So I think we start that important work with our conversations. Thank you. Um, I'm going to springboard off something off, off NASA. I think that the US and China actually carry quite a responsibility. You, you don't just have the principles, but you have the actual Artemis program. And on the back of that, you're having concrete conversations about real partnerships with also a lot of developing countries. Just like China with its Chang'e missions is inviting different payloads on there, also from developing countries. Um, 
I'm springboarding from this to Erasmo. Um, brilliant minds exist in all countries. Do we, are we just going to um, put the responsibility on the US and China with their concrete programs to involve these countries? Um, how can we ensure that the global talent, which we know is out there, is leveraged to accelerate achievement in responsible and sustainable space activities like lunar and so on? Yeah, thank you, Arti. Of course, uh, we know that uh, brilliant minds are everywhere, so that's for sure. And of course, if we use them, if we can work with them, this will be wonderful for us all. But uh, for instance, in, uh, we have uh, what, what are the programs we have made in the past on that point? So not so many. Right. I remember, for instance, uh, in Italy, when I started my career at university, uh, some of my colleagues were sent to Ethiopia to, to do some uh, lectures there and to try to, to build an aerospace uh, school there and, and so on. Um, now, for instance, we have programs everywhere where not we want to of course, uh, try to really uh, um, use all the talents that are in these emerging countries. We, we do select some of them, right? So many like to go to United States, uh, good position in universities and so on. Few, for instance, we have very uh, interesting uh, program in Europe funded by uh, European community. We do select a few uh, brilliant minds come here, but really very few. We need probably, once again, <laughs> Arti, we need actions on that. Why we do not write in the Artemis uh, Accord something related to this point? That we, we do something real on that, and we want to really to have people not only, you know, be attracted moving, but moving to be back. And, uh, and this will be wonderful. So this morning we had uh, one of the award to India, and they said, uh, that uh, they did these missions because they came here years ago, they were learning from, uh, from others, and then they start to build, and now they did it, uh, very significant uh, missions, uh, you know. So we need, uh, for IIC is also the place where you can try to do something like that, yeah? And this is probably, you know, we do know, I know you are doing a little bit, but it's not enough. This is also another point that this is a very multi-sectorial uh, topic. So mm -hmm. you cannot be take only engineer. You have to take really different expertise. And so also you can also use this kind of topics to create some new kind of uh, paths for education. Because this is very really multi-sectorial. If we talk about sustainability, you know, you have to know for so many things, if you go to moon, to Mars, you have to, be, to, to have so many knowledge uh, that are usually not in one course that you have now. So this is something that can be, this is a little provocation for people from Artemis set in, the, in this, uh, in this uh, section here, but uh, something can be put on this uh, and to do something in this direction, yeah? If you really believe that this is important, yeah. Okay. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> I love the way that each answer gives me the segue to the next question. Um, Roberto, let me come to you. I'm, I'm thinking uh, iris squared in the European Union. Uh, one of the criteria of the European Commission is make sure that SMEs are involved and that they have a role to play. When we talk about lunar and Mars, there's the push about make sure developing countries are involved, make sure they have a role to play. But here we're talking about the cutting edge of technology development. Whether it's iris squared in the European Union, whether it's lunar Mars at a global level, you really want to leverage experience and expertise. So you, you need to leverage people who, not people, but capacities that have been through a process before, they've learned their lesson and so on. So against that background, where do you see emerging space countries play into it? In general, I believe that uh, race to Mars, race to moon, and race to the outer space um, need, needs a lot of brains. So there will be, the reason there will be increasing room for everybody. To be honest at the beginning, however, I believe that priorities should be set very clearly. So only, the, only those having the top-notch technology can contribute at the beginning. 
And I think states or institutions that are traditionally ahead um, will pave the way for those who will grow in the near future. So we should not artificially boost uh, technology equality because this does not exist. We should, however, create an environment, an ecosystem in which uh, countries or institutions that are ahead create the good prerequisites for the others to develop and eventually inventing something new. Otherwise, we're going to lose the priority. The priority is being fast in doing the most difficult thing that humanity has ever met, together with maybe genomic and proteomics, but uh, that's another story. Good point. Uh, DTA jumping straight to you, leveraging that point. You've got your hands full in coordinating the ESA member states already around these activities. And with the principles of geographic return, et cetera, every member state wants to have its role. So against that background, how do you bring developing countries into uh, activities around space exploration? Um, yeah, I mean, indeed, you mentioned that, that we have 22 member states in our exploration program. And uh, they're all not only the big ones, as you can imagine. We have now started an initiative uh, to have uh, a few small missions ar around the moon and on the moon, um, in the range of 50 to 80 million, uh, launch included. Um, and I can tell you there is an immense uh, interest for the small countries to participate. So I can imagine that outside of Europe, uh, emerging countries will have exactly the same, uh, the same well. They, want, they don't want to be uh, a sub-element, a subsystem of a bigger you know, industry or, or, or program. They want to exist by themselves as well, which is very good. Um, by the way, there are, I think, uh, around 70 space agencies worldwide. That's one in three countries has a space agency. So they're not all big ones, as you can imagine. And, and nearly half of them have contributed to the Global Exploration Roadmap uh, ESA has chairing, uh, is chairing the work uh, this year, and we have issued this, uh, this uh, common document. As long as smaller countries, emerging countries, have good ideas which are aligned with this global exploration trend, I would really favor that we, 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 we go ahead uh, by promoting it. Now, there has been some examples of uh, uh, CubeSats uh, released in, in orbit. The problem, of course, with, uh, with the moon, if you want to release something on the moon or even have many uh, rovers on the surface, the ride is much more expensive, uh, not of magnitude more. So these countries are able to do these technology processes, even at university level, CubeSats and so on, but they're not able to finance the way to put this around uh, in orbit, uh, like CubeSats around uh, uh, in, in lunar orbit or whatever, we can put uh, uh, mini rovers on the surface. Therefore, we have to find a way to uh, accompany these countries. And I would even push back to you to say maybe UNASA could have a role in there to, as I said, aligned with the strategy. It has to make sense. It's not just, you know, something fancy. Uh, but any information from orbit about the moon surface is, is a good thing to have. Uh, Pam mentioned the, the huge interest in science. That's exactly what we need. But we need also uh, uh, a lot of information about precision landing and so on. So if there are interesting, brilliant minds and can provide this, we collectively should find a way uh, to push it to the next boundary, uh, to the moon, eventually even to Mars. We are also looking into uh, uh, CubeSat releases on our missions to Mars in the, next, uh, uh, in the next decade. So it's just a matter of finding the right will and finding the right way. Uh, but if it's of interest to the community, why shouldn't we find the way to do it? Excellent. Right, we're in our last nine minutes. We at COPUS, in the committee, um, and at UNUSA, we can only go as fast as our member states want us to. We have, in this year in June, set up this action team to look at sustainable lunar activities. But the reality of what's happening in the market, including from private industry, is that there's already multiple communication systems being planned around the moon. Different navigation systems being planned around the moon, right? So. 
my question to you is, actually, I'm wondering what is the real question behind that? It's not obvious. We have to get a handle on this. The moon is one-sixth of the size uh, of Earth. It cannot support so many systems. Fast forward five years from now, what, just as your starter for 10, what do you think is the situation? Do you believe we will have a handle on this? Or are we going to be confounded with a new sustainability problem like we already have on Earth? Your starter for 10, Pam. Oh, I think this is a really hot topic, uh, particularly in calm navigation for us. It's a hot topic for NASA inside the U.S. government. Um, there are others who may want to go to the moon, uh, other parts of the government, industry, et cetera. Those standards are absolutely critical. Uh, and uh, actually, there's been a, a communications and data standards organization um, that NASA co-chairs for years called CCSDS that sets communications and data standards across it's all the space agencies. So there's a good, good leverage point there, uh, but absolutely with the ESA's Moonlight program, absolutely we are talking about the idea of interoperability. I mean, the idea is that if people want dedicated communications capability because the, the reality is, uh, even with the size of the moon, I mean, here on Earth, what? Everybody wants more bandwidth all the time, right? More data, more bandwidth, right? Nobody ever wanted less power or less data. And so the, what's critical is that we have a set of standards and in interoperability. I mean, look for a moment at the internet and the power of having, you know, standard protocol for that that enables you to scale it. And so we're talking about that too, because the way the internet works here on Earth, it's not going to work that way with RF signals in space. And so we're already having conversations about internet. It's actually probably 3.0, not 2.0, uh, with all kinds of interesting new technologies like delay and disruption tolerant networking, store and forward technologies that will enable us to have solar system internet. So, I, I mean, maybe I'm just winding back to the place I started at the beginning, but this interoperability and standardization. And to your point, when you were talking to Roberto, well, how do you make industry do that? Collaborate to compete, right? But things like a USB standard came because there was a big dog in industry, and in this case, the big dog has to be us in government to say, no, we're going to be interoperable because it's in the interest of the collaboration of our countries with each other. And so we will work together to set standards that industry then is obligated to follow. We won't buy your stuff if it doesn't meet those standards. So, I mean, it, I, I think there are challenges to that approach, but we've got to start somewhere, and that's where we're starting now. And can we incentivize it? I mean, we keep talking about the need for governments uh, uh, or space agencies to come together and set the rules and guidelines and so on. What about incentivizing it? Is there room for that? Well, the incentive for industry is they won't get a contract otherwise. I think the incentive for... <laughs> it's true. The, to, to, well am I said. wrong, Roberto? No, no, I'm totally wrong. <laughs> we'll agree. I've been on both sides. <laughs> Uh, totally but I do think um, what we are trying to create, I think, with our collaboration, this is why we feel so strongly about the Artemis program being having international partnerships. Because when we take the decision to work together, mm -hmm. that's the, you've created the incentive. And, uh, you know, we, we, we have some dissimilar redundancy on the International Space Station, but in a lot of ways we converged on standards for certain things so that we could share each other's resources. And that, we have to create the incentive by the will. Brilliant. Um, Didier, coming back to this side of the, the panel, your, your view, five years from now, where are we? Multiple communication navigation systems, or have we got a handle on it? Well, uh, first of all, I hope that we will have Moonlight in place, which is our navigational communication uh, uh, system uh, around the moon. We have the, the Pathfinder in preparation. Uh, that would be great, uh, but in addition to this, uh, our next flagship around Mars is really centered about communication and navigation capabilities. Uh, so we will um, uh, sign the contracts in the coming weeks for the phase AB1 studies, 
of what is called uh, the light ship, um, which is a quite complex beast. Um, and there also, it is not just the moon, it is Mars. Today is moon to Mars discussion. And for once, I think we're a little bit ahead in the thinking because we have also an interdirectorate group at ESA on a solar system internet. So uh, we're really uh, looking with all the directorates being the science directorate, of course, exploration, the operations directorate and others, and of course, telecommunication, navigation and so on. All of us, we are thinking now uh, much more global. We think solar system internet is the next way ahead. Brilliant. And therefore, obviously, interoperability is uh, for, of the utmost importance. Thank you. We have three minutes left, so one minute each. Roberto? What do you want to know? <laughs> Five years from now, what does it look like? We'll be struggling like, like today. I mean, it's the technology, the challenge is terrible. Uh, so uh, I think we, we have many challenges. Uh, I, I'm, I'm from the industry. Don't let me make forecasts. We know exactly where we have to go. How we arrive there is unclear yet. A dose of realism. Uh, Teodoro, give us some hope. <laughs> wow, okay. We will be on the moon. Okay. Uh, I mean, uh, many things will change. Uh, we have very important technology now, which are already developed and impacting deeply our technology, generally speaking. Um, and so, I hope that we will be able to use the, this new technology for the humankind and not for other things. Thank you. Erasmo, can you give me 60 seconds worth? Yeah, you know, I have not details of this project because uh, yeah, I'm not involved uh, much, but you know, one of the things that is uh, quite important is also uh, when we do this project, we also need to, uh, to convince the people to put money on it. And um, one point that, uh, yeah, we have to find a way to, uh, to really uh, involve the people on that. And um, um, in, many, in many cases, uh, it will be nice to, to see also what are the reasons, you know, that uh, put us doing this kind of things. And, um, you know, and, uh, for instance, you know, we, we know that Prometeo went to get the fire, you know. We, now we are looking for the water somewhere, but he was looking for the fire at that time. <laughs> and came back and gave something to us. So this is also something we want to really make clear. So what is the advantages of people? You know, uh, Roberto said he has a contract, so he has to, to, to go through the contract. But people that are putting money on it, they want to see what is the advantages of that. You know, if you go to uh, arts or literature, you can find some poems. Like we have one in in, in Italy that is uh, uh, Ariosto, and this uh, in this in this Ariosto there is one that is uh, Astolfo is walk is going to the moon because on the moon there are the things that are we lost on the earth, <laughs> so it's also something, yeah, you can try to, 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 to make, well, <laughs> sorry, I'm probably not really on the point you want from me, but. <laughs> no, that is absolutely perfect. We went from realism to optimism to surrealism and, and hope again. <laughs> so, you know, when I, when I was preparing this session, I asked uh, Teodoro, I said, what is your definition of success for this session? And he said, I don't want participants to talk about what they're doing nationally. Um, I want to make sure that we have a conversation that includes developing countries, and I want to make sure that it's a stimulating discussion. I think it was. I hope you agree. Please join me in thanking our panelists for this one. Thank you. So, um, just I, I thought, please uh, stay a few more minutes because we, we have an important event for the AIDA and also agreed by Leonardo and by, uh, by Yasi. So we want to, this year, as we told, uh, and the opening ceremony is also 60 years from the first satellite was launched uh, in Italy in the 64. 
and then we want to celebrate by uh, having for the first time the Abroglio medal. And the Broglio medal is uh, uh, assigned in this IAC here in, in Milano. So uh, we have a, just a, I think, 90 second video about Broglio. So please uh, show the video. È il 15 dicembre del 1964, ora locale 20 e 24. La tensione è inevitabile. Finalmente il razzo scout si solleva dalla rampa, la spinta è fulminea, il San Marco sparisce dalla vista. Sono attimi di ansia, poi minuti. La stazione siciliana di Punta Pachino, allestita per l'occasione, non riceve alcun segnale. C'è preoccupazione. La conferma arriva poco dopo dalla stazione di Woomera, in Australia, che intercetta il primo bip. Il San Marco ce l'ha fatta, è in orbita. Can I come on stage, uh, past president of AIDA, Amalia, just to help me to announce the winner? So, Amalia, okay, please. So, um, I think I, I have to announce the winner now. I want to have uh, Amalia, which is a past president of AIDA, and also, you know, very well-known name in this, uh, in, uh, in this, uh, in this, uh, uh, in I International Astronautical Federation. So, the winner of the first Broglio medal is Ernesto Valerani. I have just short motivation about it, very, very, very few lines. So Ernesto is uh, extremely known in this field. He has organized uh, a very successful IEC in Torino years ago. And he was the initiator of the Columbus program that he proposed as joint Italian-German initiative at the European Space Agency. He deserves the award for, for his pioneering and outstanding contribution in human space flight. His dedication and achievement brought Italy at the forefront of space exploration by making Thales Alenia Space Italia the world leader in the construction of pressurized modules. Thank you. So, congratulations. <laughs> Qualcuno che fa una foto? Ok. Io qua? Vieni, vieni, Ernesto, vieni più là? Ok, mettiamo la donna. Ok. We have all, tonight we have also here uh, a nephew of uh, sure. <laughs> Professor Broglio, so please just stand up. And we have also the, uh, the major of the municipality where Professor Broglio, uh, born in Italy, is a, uh, 
a village close to Torino. <laughs> so they will give you something. Prego, prego. Porta pure, porti pure. Poi magari vuoi dire qualcosa, ma proprio due secondi. It's also. Ok, no, va bene, tanto sa tutto. Ok, questo è un... Per il professor Erasmo, per aver istituito questo premio importante in onore del nostro concittadino per ricordarlo ai posteri. E okay. Quindi... <ride> ok, d'accordo, grazie. Sì, sì. Ok. Uh, do you want to say something? Uh, just, yeah, just, few words. just just one word. When we started uh, 60 years ago, the world, uh, the world sustainable was not existing. There was the word impossible. For Italy, it was impossible to believe that we could participate to the exploration. So that was a limitation that when I started working in space was too hard for us. And so we decided that uh, it was necessary to achieve a place for Italy in space. So we worked very hard in order to find the way, and we were lucky enough to embark in some European space agency programs like Space Lab and later on into the station. Well, it was not easy. It was necessary to excite the imagination and uh, to achieve uh, the results. We made it. Now, with uh, your permission, I wish to dedicate this medal to my colleagues and to the many employers who have followed me in the hard job to convince that also Italy was in a position to have its place in space. If you look up, you see a lot of hardware that has been built in Torino, the Columbus module, the Leonardo permanent module. You can add a couple of nodes of the space station, and why not also the cupola? So, Italy is in space. Now, the young people and I have seen today a lot of young people are prepared to continue. Keep going. Ah, oh, wait a second. One more word. One more word. A part of this medal belongs to my wife. Stand up. So I, I just can add a uh, few seconds. I think from my point of view, I think uh, the two Italians that have more contributed to space are Broglio and Valerani. And what is nice that they had quite a different approach as far as I understood. You know, Professor Broglio was considering uh, the space something that should belong to the government, only to the government. And Ernesto was convinced that this was a good stuff, but also industry should play a role in that. And they did very good, very successful things both, you know, with different approach, because they were both extremely passionate in space. This was 
put the, the two in common. And ja now I give the word to Amalia that will close the ceremony. Just a moment to say that Ernesto Valerani was a school uh, friend of mine, no? We had the same age, no, you are one year older than me. Yeah. No, that is, <laughs> no, that's important, that's important. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, Ernesto was a good boy, a good student, and uh, we spent some beautiful time to get together. But I take this opportunity just to say that you said about sustainability, no? Sustainability, um, opportunity, the perfect activity, and so on. I think that this concept of sustainability is particularly important for women because we spent all our life to take into account what are, what are the consequences of what we said, what we do, for, with respect to other people, and so in particular to young generation. So I think that the contribute of men like that, but in general, of the people or women is important for space, the future of space. Thank you very much. Oh, well. <laughs> Of course, I am. Of course, I have, I have to thank uh, the president of AINA because uh, you really made me an honor and you moved my, me in uh, this uh, very prestigious uh, medal and I am glad to receive from your hands. Grazie mille. And now you are free.